Hi, everybody. Uh, happy Sunday. I hope everybody had an awesome weekend. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, hang out with everybody tonight. My name is Lee Hartman. I am the winemaker at Blue Stem Vineyard. And tonight we are going to be drinking through some of the Chardonnays that we make uh, uh, at Blue Stem. Uh, so everything that we're going to taste today is made from 100% Chardonnay. It will all be uh, uh, coming from grapes that are grown on our property and uh, everything that my team and I have put together over the last several years. Um, the, uh, the oldest being 2017 uh, and uh, the other two are from 2018. Uh, 2019 will be released pretty soon and uh, uh, very excited to be looking forward to those. Um, if you're uh, jumping on the live stream, please feel free to uh, comment. Let me know that you're on here. And uh, if you have any questions uh, throughout the tasting, please do let me know. I spend most of my days um, by myself in a room full of barrels and tanks and uh, listening to podcasts and music. So um, if I'm going too fast um, or if, uh, if I'm uh, taking too long on anything, please do let me know. So uh, thanks for joining. Uh, so we have uh, four acres of Chardonnay which uh, is our largest planting to date so far. Um, hey, Matt, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for saying, hey, let me know that you're here. Um, so we have four acres of Chardonnay, a little bit more than that, uh, making it uh, pretty much our largest planting at, at this point. Um, hey, Trev, how we doing, man? And so we are, uh, we have a lot of Chardonnay coming in the door every harvest season. So. When, when we uh, get started with harvest season, one of the first things to come in is Chardonnay. Uh, and so rather than just making uh, 17 tons or 15 tons or whatever we get in a given year, uh, all of one kind of Chardonnay, we wanted to uh, diversify it a little bit and uh, make several different wines, different expressions of Chardonnay and, um, and what, that, uh, what, what all that can look like. So... Um, starting in 2017, we started making our first sparkling wine. That one is still uh, still unreleased. We haven't finished it yet, and uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that here in just a second. Um, but this year, uh, during the harvest season, we did release our 2018 uh, Blanc de Blanc, which we're super excited about. A Blanc de Blanc is a sparkling wine uh, made up of uh, sparkling wine made out of white grapes, as opposed to a Blanc de Noir, which would be uh, something made mostly of Pinot, uh, Pinot Noir, um, and uh, still a, a white wine, but it comes uh, from uh, the Pinot Noir grapes. And so, um, so we we started in 2017, uh, 2018. We decided to continue doing it. What we do is we end up harvesting our grapes uh, one to two weeks earlier than the rest of our still. Uh, Chardonnay grapes. So when we harvest early, we are going to uh, bring in the fruit before it has uh, as much sugar. So by having less sugar, that means we're going to have less potential alcohol, which is what we're looking for in a Chardonnay. Uh, we're also going to have a good bit more acidity, and that's uh, really important to make sure that your sparkling is uh, good and fresh, uh, something that you're going to want to uh, um, uh, put together with food or to, to start an evening. Uh, you're, you're not going to want anything that's overly ripe and uh, and heavy. So uh, we ferment it uh, all dry, all the way. Uh, get all the sugar out, and then uh, then we bottle it with some uh, yeast and some sugar, uh, 24 grams per liter to be exact. And then uh, that's when the real fun starts. So um, uh, before this warms up too much, I wanted to show you how to open a bottle of sparkling wine. First, you, uh, you open up the foil, which is easily done. Then you'll, you'll take off the wire hood. This hood hooks under um, this little ridge in the bottle. And so what that does is it, uh, it keeps the cork from coming out. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of weight uh, being held on, that, on this uh, wire hood. You'll take that off, keep your thumb over the cork, um, particularly um, if you have any inclination that it's been 
jostled or anything like that. You don't want the CO2 that is in the bottle to uh, push it out too much. It's going to do that on its own. Then you uh, twist it almost like you do a screw cap. Uh, you're not trying to move it up. Your cork is going to do that on its own. But by twisting it, you're just getting that thing moving a little bit. Here it goes. And voila. How do they get all those bubbles in there? So as I was saying before I, I opened the bottle, we add 24 grams of sugar per liter uh, to the finished still wine that we've already fermented. It's lower in alcohol because we had less sugar to start with. Um, uh, it is clarified, it's filtered, it, we finish it um, just like we would most normal white wines. Um, we add that sugar, we add some yeast back to it, and uh, then you have this kind of cloudy looking wine that we put in a bottle, and then we seal this, this bottle itself with uh, basically a beer cap, and, and that'll sit right here on the top of the bottle, uh, keeping uh, all the contents uh, uh, in the bottle, not going to let any, uh, any, anything push it out like, like you might find with a cork. So um, those 24 grams of sugar will turn into about one and a half percent alcohol and a little bit more than a half of a gram um, per, or I'm sorry, no, um, uh, so it'll turn into one and a half percent alcohol and then the rest will all turn into carbon dioxide. And with a beer cap, it traps all of it in there. Uh, about a year to a year and a half later, we uh, open that bottle up that CO2 pushes out the dead yeast, and, um, and uh, oh, hey, Pam, nice to see you. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the CO2 will push out the yeast. Uh, we, we top the bottle back up a little bit with that bit of wine that we lost, and then we put in uh, a mushroom cork and that wire hood, and then we're done. So, that's why champagne and sparkling wine often cost a lot more than, than a still wine. Uh, where you would be finished um, with your wine after uh, 10 months uh, making a, a normal Chardonnay, uh, you're only getting started with a sparkling wine. You've got a whole nother uh, fermentation and a whole nother bottling to do. So now that we have a sparkling Chardonnay or our Blanc de Blanc, there we go. Um, what kind of glass should we pour it into? So I have a couple of options tonight. The first one is kind of the old timey coupe. It looks like this. So the reason that people would drink out of these kind of glasses uh, is that it has a very wide mouth. It's very thin. And so it really lets a lot of, a lot of bubbles kind of tickle your nose. Uh, it's a great way to uh, let, let your whole face uh, in a way uh, experience the wine, but your wine's going to go flat real fast. Um, so, so that's why these aren't necessarily the best. Um, uh, you know, these are really great glasses if you're making uh, breakfast cocktails or if you're having a roaring 20s party and everybody is dressed up uh, like gangsters and flappers. These are great for that, but for sparkling wine, not necessarily ideal. Um, the other option uh, we don't even have in this house, um, but they are flutes, and I think most of us have seen them. They are super skinny, really tall, and they make a lot of sense when it comes to uh, preserving that freshness of the wine. They are the opposite of a coupe. So uh, a flute will maintain uh, all those bubbles. It's not open, uh, but because of that, you're not able to really experience the wine uh, as well. It will keep your wine fresh, but that doesn't mean that you're going to uh, be able to get a good nose. You're not going to smell the aromas. You're not going to uh, get get uh, as as good of a of an overall experience as you would um, with other glasses. The ones that we use for good sparkling wine in this house is kind of a hybrid. This is a tulip glass. You can kind of see that it's um, it's still tall, just like a flute. Uh, but it is a little bit more opened up, so you're able to uh, smell it. You're able to swirl it. If you are not a total dork about wine and you don't have 
specific uh, glasses for every different kind of wine. We also, in this house, use what we call our everyday glasses. Um, these are also made by Riedel. Uh, this is a white wine glass. There is nothing wrong with drinking your sparkling wine out of these. We do it frequently when we don't feel like using the really delicate glass or if we're, or if we're making breakfast cocktails. So, um, so what else can I say about the production of sparkling wine? We, uh, like all of our Chardonnays, we, we bring the fruit in the door, we chill it overnight, uh, and then we load it into the press uh, whole, uh, whole cluster, so we don't crush into stem at all. And by doing that, we are able to um, we are able to keep kind of uh, the purest juice uh, possible. If you crush into stem, you end up with a bin full of juice and skins and seeds and little bits of stem that got ripped up. And then you end up kind of making a Chardonnay soup or a tea. And, and you're going to extract a lot of bitterness and phenolics from the skins. And that's not what we're looking for here. We want something that's really super clean. And um, uh, so when we load it into the press and it starts squeezing those berries, that juice uh, will drop out of the cluster and fall to the pan before it has any chance to soak on the skins. And that's important whether doing a barrel ferment, stainless steel, or a sparkling wine. So, so when I, um, when we are finishing our sparkling wine, there are a lot of different levels of sweetness that you can uh, make a sparkling wine at. And the most common that you've probably seen on a label at some point, it'll say Brut, B-R-U-T. And that is a level of sweetness. Uh, so when, when we disgorge or the CO2 pushes that yeast out, um, uh, we lose a little bit of wine at that point. And so uh, frequently uh, champagne producers or sparkling wine producers will add some sugar back to that bottle uh, just to kind of round it out a little bit. Sometimes uh, sparkling wines with all that effervescence, they can be very bracing and, um, and you want a little bit of softness on the palate and sugar is a good way to kind of round it out. Um, we decided not to do that. So instead of being classified as a brute wine, this one is a uh, is has no dosage. That little added sugar is called dosage. So so this one has none of that. We wanted something that was um, uh, a little bit brighter. We really liked our 2018 and how much fruit it already had to it. Uh, this one is not aged. Uh, super long, so this one has more fruit than it does yeast characteristic to it. And so because of that, we decided, uh, so just no sugar, no dosage, and uh, we really, really like how it turned out. Awesome. We, we have really enjoyed uh, not only being able to offer a sparkling wine, but um, we've really enjoyed just making it and studying it. It is a whole new level of winemaking and uh, taking things, yeah, just, just to, to another level. Um, and it's really cool uh, getting to know other people in the industry who have been doing this for a while, other people who are now just trying for the first time, whether it's um, a pet nat, which is a petulant natural where you uh, take the fermenting juice uh, the first time around and you uh, bottle it before it's even done fermenting the first time, uh, making uh, method champenois like we have here, which is the traditional way it's done in, um, in, uh, in Champagne. Uh, we have a few producers, uh, even in the Valley, I believe Cave Ridge is making a Charmat style where uh, they use pressurized tanks. They do a second fermentation in that tank and then they bottle that wine under pressure, it's, uh, is a, which is another a different way of making it. It's uh, uh, made uh, similar to how they do it in Prosecco. So, um, so yeah, it's it's a whole whole thing that that we've been studying, and I'm really excited to to continue studying um, as well. So uh, the next wine that we have here comes from the same vintage. Uh, it was fermented in a tank just next to uh, the one that we just had. 
uh, the sparkling Blanc de Blanc. This is just our stainless steel. I'm, I'm used to uh, I'm used to these cameras being like a mirror, um, but they make it, make it difficult, to make you make it realistic. So uh, the stainless steel, uh, just as the name implies, uh, we we load up a tank full of juice. Uh, we we chill it. We we let uh, all the sediment uh, before fermentation settle to the bottom. You ever have a bottle of simply orange juice where uh, you open the fridge and uh, everything is kind of settled to the bottom? We do the same thing, but we do it, you know, 500 gallons at a time. Uh, we take that good, clean stuff off the top. We move it to another tank. Uh, we get rid of all the gunk on the bottom, uh, let the juice warm up. And then once it gets to about 60 degrees in the upper 50s, uh, we add yeast uh, and we let it let fermentation take its uh, take its course. So one of the things I love about doing that is just how clean and bright um, uh, your wine can turn out and just how, uh, in a way, how naked your wine is. There's nothing to cover it up. There's nothing to change about it. It's just very clean, just very um, unadulterated. And uh, And I'm not saying that a barrel fermented wine uh, that there's anything wrong with that. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I, I love doing barrel fermentations, but, but by doing it in a tank, it is just, um, yeah, it is very clean, very honest. Um, it is meant to be consumed young. It's refreshing, which makes it great with food. Um, but with all that, that acidity, uh, that, that, that you find in it, um, uh, not only does, does it make it better with food, but, um, you know, it can be enjoyed in its youth or or uh, after a few years. This tw uh, 2018, I think you could you could enjoy this for the next three to five years. You know, I know a lot of people seem to think that uh, white wines are meant to be consumed uh, within a year of harvest, and red wines are the ones that you hold on to. But you know, we have some uh, some Chardonnay that we made in 2015, and we're still holding on to it. I, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's one that you can actually hold on to. One of the nice things that I like about Chardonnay is that it is not an aromatic varietal. And I really enjoy working with those varietals too. I think that, um, uh, you know, Petit Mansang is, is a very popular option. So is, uh, so is Viognier. I love working with both of them. Uh, we've been making those for years as well. Um, we, we even planted uh, Petit Mansang right outside of our house, so we're, we're excited to have that in our front yard. But, um, you know, whether it's either of those two, Traminettes, um, you know, with, with a more neutral grape like Chardonnay or even a Vidal Blanc, uh, you know, you're able to uh, see the hand of the winemaker and you're able to... Uh, get to understand the site where everything comes from a little bit better. There's, there's less aromatics to hide behind. And so because of that, uh, I think that it, it makes it much more nuanced and interesting. So, so we opened up this um, stainless steel Chardonnay earlier today to have with one. So don't even need to open that one. Um, so for this one, I'm just gonna go ahead and use our everyday Riedel white wine glass. If you would like to upgrade your, your stems and don't want to uh, blow the budget, we do sell uh, our everyday Riedels in, uh, in the tasting room. I think they're seven or eight bucks a piece in there. We have both red and white, so they, they kind of uh, cover the spectrum. Uh, everything that I'm going to be tasting t tonight, um, you could definitely uh, enjoy uh, in a Read a white wine glass. Yeah, in 2018, it rained a lot. And so because of that, uh, I think that our, our whites are really shining a lot better than some of our reds. And I think that we, we made some good reds in 2018. Uh, most of them have not been released yet, but in 2018, those those grapes that come in early, we were able to uh, uh, let it avoid a lot of that 
rain and late season issues that, that we ran into. Chardonnay, when it's one of the first ones off the vine every year, you, 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 you do take that into account when you are thinking about harvest season and do you grow grapes in an area that sometimes experiences hurricanes. And uh, so, so for that reason, uh, we really love Chardonnay. In 2020, we also had some uh, things happen with Chardonnay, uh, but because they come in early, they're safer at the end of the year. They also bud out early, which means they are in greater danger of frost. And so because of that, this year, um, you know, instead of 15 to 17 tons of Chardonnay, we ended up with, I think, about four, uh, which hurts a lot. You know, we... We, we have other varietals that did really well. Um, I think for our almost four acres of the doll, we, we also got about 17 tons, even this year, even with frosts, you know, it's, it's a real trooper. Uh, Chardonnay is a little bit more delicate. And um, uh, that, was, that was really hard walking up and down those rows, the rows um, that, you, that you pass first on your way to Bluestone from Bridgewater. Uh, those very first rows are a uh, thousand foot long rows of Chardonnay. And that was that was a, a, a tough walk going through there and seeing lots of little shriveled shoots. Um, so um, uh, back to the, the stainless Chardonnay, we, uh, we, we ferment it, it goes totally dry. We leave the yeast in the tank. About once a month, we might stir up the, the, uh, the yeast that has settled to the bottom. Uh, those yeast cells start to break down over time and they add some body and complexity to your wine. And, uh, and then we end up bottling this stuff in, uh, I think this stuff was bottled in uh, April, a couple of years ago. And uh, if you're enjoying this, if you do enjoy our stainless Chardonnay, uh, I think we have about two cases left of this vintage. Uh, and then we'll be moving on to our 2019. So... Um, it's, it's always one of those things whenever I know that we're getting close to the end of a vintage, I always need to grab a few bottles. So I always want to make sure that people know that uh, as well. So uh, I'm going to grab a few of those bottles tomorrow. But if you wanted any of them, uh, we, we only have a couple left. So our, our very last uh, bottle that I'm going to uh, share with you guys tonight um, is our barrel fermented 2017. And I also wanted to just take a second uh, for everybody who is still on there and show you how to open a bottle of wine if you don't actually know. So this is called a, a waiter's key and it is the easiest and most simple way to open a bottle of wine. Uh, every Christmas I have people ask, you know, I found this really cool new uh, way of opening a bottle of wine, there's these rabbit ears or this electric thing or whatever, and I want to get it for my, my, my spouse or my friend who really loves wine. And I always just tell them, if your friend really loves wine, you should, you should just get them wine. Um, if they have one of these, they're not going to improve upon it. So uh, rather than uh, putting the course through into the bottle and twisting like this, it's a lot easier if you just get it started, as I was just doing, you'll get about one, maybe one and a half rotations in. And then rather than twisting your hand over and over this handle, just grab the handle and then don't let go. And then you can let, open your hand and close your hand around the bottle. And it goes a lot faster. So uh, anybody who has worked in the Toast the Weekend tent uh, knows, knows how to open those bottles really fast. When we, when we have to open several hundred bottles in one night, you, you get your practice in. Uh, and then uh, just in time for us to take our best-selling wines at Toast the Weekend, our, our Moscato and Crooked and Weedy and Bow, and now we've got screw caps on them, so that makes it a lot easier. But some of these wines, we're still going to use corks, so uh, it's still important to, to know how to do that. So when I'm making a barrel fermented Chardonnay, that's my favorite kind of Chardonnay. I really enjoy uh, sparkling and I really like steel fermented, which by the way, we should close up our sparkling wine. Uh, if you don't have one of these, this is a uh, 
a closure for a sparkling bottle and it keeps all the CO2 in, keeps them nice and fresh. They're only a couple bucks. We also sell those in the tasting room. Uh, if you're somebody who drinks sparkling wine on, uh, on a regular basis and you totally should be. But if you are drinking um, our barrel ferment, that is my favorite kind to make. And here's why. Rather than just having one big monolithic tank where if I make an acid adjustment to it or I want to use uh, this kind of yeast, I have to do it to the entire batch. Whereas if I'm working with, um, you know, a dozen or two dozen barrels, that's a dozen or two dozen different batches I can, I can not only run experiments on, but I can use to add complexity to the final wine. So I might have a dozen different barrels and have one of them be brand new um, and the rest of them older, or maybe some of them are two years old or three years old and they're all different ages. Um, maybe some of them ferment at 59 degrees, some of them uh, ferment a little bit warmer, upward of 70 degrees. Maybe I use different yeasts, maybe um, some, uh, some come from different blocks, uh, so there's different ripeness levels. And by doing that, I'm, I'm able to not only uh, spend every single year running lots of experiments and saying, you know, let's try this yeast here. Uh, I really enjoyed this uh, style. Let's do that on these five barrels. But I can, I can say, you know, this barrel tastes great. Next year, let's do half of them like that. Or I can taste through them and say, I like this barrel, but it doesn't work with the profile that we're trying to make. So don't do that one again. Uh, and then you blend all these barrels together and it makes your wine that much more interesting and complex. So it's a, you know, even though we grew all the fruit and it's all Chardonnay and it's all from the same year, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a blend in a way. Even though it says Chardonnay instead of white blend, it, it kind of is. So, um, so this is from 2017. And I'm going to use a different Riedel glass again. Uh, this is their Montrachet glass. This is not Montrachet. Uh, you're you're going to spend $23 on it instead of $93 on it. But it does have a nice uh, open top, so you can really get a good nose on it. You can have a nice wide swirl with it. I do love those glasses. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, so when we, we put all that together, um, I'm always excited to see uh, how all those different parts um, really work together. And as I always tell people, when your mom's favorite wine is Chardonnay and you're a winemaker, you should you should put some focus on that. So um, this one, as as every year is, this one's for my mom. It's really common with Chardonnay uh, to put uh, some of it or all of it through a malolactic fermentation. Uh, a malolactic fermentation is when you take malic acid, which is found in all grapes, and you uh, and this generally happens after alcoholic fermentation, where the sugar is turned into alcohol and carbon dioxide. Um, you take that malic acid, which tastes like bright green apples, which maybe you noticed a bit more in the stainless steel uh, Chardonnay. Uh, and that is then converted with bacteria into lactic acid and carbon dioxide. And as, as it sounds, uh, lactic acid will be softer, a little bit creamier. It's not, uh, it's still an acid, but it's less, less of a strong acid. So it's kind of less, less acidic. And uh, so because of that, you end up with this kind of softer, creamier style wine. We let, uh, as I was saying, uh, to build complexity, we let some of our barrels go through MLF, as it's called, um, malolactic fermentation. Uh, and we, some of them we do not. So we, we arrest it and we keep some of that fresh malic acid uh, in there. So, um, so because of that, this one is soft. It's, it's kind of um, you get that kind of uh, broad uh, palate feel of a marshmallow, but at the same time has that that spine that you would want in a wine so that it's got 
got some some acid backbone to it. Um, you know, I think that that making Chardonnay, making all wine, uh, takes a lot of um, focus on balance. Uh, but I think that that Chardonnay in particular is a real exercise in that, and so that's that's always fun to try to try to get that seesaw to sit just right. So. Um, uh, any questions from anybody, uh, do feel free to, to uh, just write it in the chat box. Let me know if you have any questions about our Chardonnay, uh, how we grow it, how we make it. Um, we use uh, several different clones in the field. So we have clone 37, which is a, um, a clone from uh, Champagne. We also have uh, uh, clones 69 and 70, which are Dijon clones. So those those do come from from Burgundy itself. Um, yeah, always one of the first things out the gate, always one of the first things in the door uh, during harvest, one of my favorite things to work with. So uh, it's been super awesome hanging out and talking with you guys. Um, thanks so much for drinking my wine. Uh, and uh, if there's anything else that you'd like us down the road to do a tasting of from down here in my cellar, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So. Uh, until next time, thanks so much, guys. Um, happy 2021. I think people are still saying it, but uh, uh, it's, it still rings true. So I hope everybody has a, a great start to their year, and we'll, we'll see you guys again soon. Thanks a bunch.